Hi, and welcome to Let's Talk Mental Health with Mel Norton. Um, today, I'm joined by my very lovely friend and work colleague, Avril Ishmael. Um, Avril, do you want to say hello to everyone? Hello. <laughs> do you want to tell everyone a little bit about um, the charity you work with? Because today we're going to talk about guideposts and GIS <laughs> service. Um, which is a charity based across Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire that you work with um, and that I help with sometimes yeah. as well. Just tell okay. me about that and, and then what your, your, your role is within that and your background. Yeah, okay. Well, Guidepost is a, a charity that has been around for about 40 odd years, actually. Um, and it exists in Oxfordshire, Hertfordshire, but also Gloucestershire, where I'm, I'm based. The... The, um, it, initially, it started as a mental as, as a, a charity for people with learning disabilities, and it still does have a lot. Of, you know, it still retains a lot of that with its services and its emphasis. But it also has um, an emphasis on mental health as well, particularly in Hertfordshire um, and and also in Gloucestershire. And, and that's really where the guidepost information and support service has has originated from. We secured big lottery funding some years ago to set up the GIS um, but in a different form where we're looking at social prescribing um, we were sort of bringing a social prescribing service together and then the pandemic happened and we had to quickly shift and adapt to, um, to sort of meeting the needs of, of, of people um, around the pandemic so initially we, we, we set up a helpline and a support service around practical problem solving um, and when people found that they you know they that they, they sort of solved those problems then we sort of moved into more sort of emotional support and that's where we are today really we um, have the helpline but we also take referrals from um, healthcare professionals and also from individuals themselves we can actually offer a, a sort of a, a, a six to eight to 12 week support package around um, people's mental health, um, which is sort of goal orientated. And uh, we're not counselling, we're actually more coaching than anything else. So we, we sit in that space between sort of mentoring and counselling and therapy. We sort of sit in the middle of it, really, around sort of coaching and, and support. Yeah. So that's 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 the nice thing I found working alongside you and listening to what you do is that you do very much um, a, a, a supportive role, but not you're not necessarily delivering therapy to people, but you're using your therapeutic skills yeah. to support yeah. people in the roles they have in the community. Um, yeah, our skills and techniques are, are, are very much borrowed, I think, from the therapy area particularly um, of communication skills and also those little things from CBT like a bit of reframing here and there and um, and also that we don't we're not doing that deep dive into sort of people's childhood experiences for example which you might find within certain therapies you know it's very much in the sort of here and now and it's very much focused on on problem solving but it's also a space for people to feel safe contained we can help to sort of hold people a bit really um, it's confidential we put a lot of emphasis on engagement um, and yes and actually just giving people that opportunity to in a safe place to be able to sort of talk about something that's really that's affecting them and the issues they have yeah Wonderful. And, and so um, you and I both have an NHS background, um, but you've also done lecturing, which I've never done. Yeah. I'm never <laughs> good enough to do that. <laughs> um, but what, what, just before we go on to talk about um, some of the conditions that you've found that, that work, you work with at the moment, um, I just want to do a bit of jargon busting for everybody. So when we use the term CBT, which Avril and I will slip in and out of, because we're just so used to saying it. That's cognitive behaviour therapy, isn't it? And then there's one that we might talk about shortly called DBT, which is dialectical behaviour therapy. Yeah. Uh, and those are different therapy systems that are used and evidence-based within therapeutic treatment in the NHS or in any um, sort of medical-based de service delivery. Um, but what we're talking about in terms of guideposts and in terms of supporting people in the community is using the skill sets from that day in day-to-day -day things 
Is that right? Is that how you do yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So um, as I as I mentioned, from you know, we look at the cognitive behaviour therapy. It's a, an approach which is you know working very much with people's thoughts and their moods and their behaviours and how those are sort of interlinked really. Um, and because when we're depressed, for example, we might have a sort of distorted way of seeing the world. Our thoughts might be, um, you know, they, they, they might, might work in a certain way. We might have a certain style of thinking around things, which we do when we're depressed. We sort of see the world through a slightly different lens, don't we? Yes. And, and, and CBT helps you to examine that and to just look at how we can alter or shift that style of thinking. And where, and where that originates from, where does that, where do those thoughts come from? Yeah. Um, and, and obviously in DBT, which I think we'll talk about shortly in a minute, is, is very much um, sort of brings in certain other aspects, I think, of, of looking at mood as well, but also things like mindfulness and yes. mood regulation. When I say mood regulation, how we sort of sometimes certain styles of thinking can lead us to think in extremes so it's either black or white you know and sometimes we're not always that good at looking at that gray area in the middle um, and, and you know so we you know we can help people to sort of navigate those particular areas as well yeah so that's that's just a very briefly i mean just a brief outline really. Yeah, and, and, and I think when people aren't feeling very well, they can they can suddenly go a long way from, from where they start in their thinking, mm. shooting over to a, quite a strong reaction very quickly. Mm. So those skill yeah. sets, if we're using them with people, it's not full-on therapy, but it but it helps them to adjust yeah. and come back from that very extreme response and that very negative thinking. Yeah. Thinking. And I think that's... But also, I think for, for us with the GIS, what is a, a sort of very... Uh, an important thing that we do is we do what's called sort of psychoeducation. Oh, that's the term it is. So we we talk to people about what it is, uh, you know, give them some context around it to help them to sort of find out a bit more about what's going on for them, sort of giving them information really and developing their knowledge and understanding around it. Um, the principle being that if we can enable people to, to get mastery over their symptoms rather than symptoms having mastery over them if that makes sense it's sort of yeah. a, helping them to manage and control their, their symptoms a bit more mm. that's a really lovely way to, to think of it isn't it mm. having mastery over what's going on inside mm. you being controlled by it and that's a, yeah. a really nice goal to work for as well mm. it's, it's about being the best person you can be in your situation yeah that's right absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah so one of the groups i know since the pandemic the um nature of some of your client groups has changed and as you said you, you had to pivot everything you know like, like a lot of people did um mm. but one of the things we've talked about a lot and, and i've heard about when when i um tune into some of your team meetings is you're working with people with very complex emotional presentations who who may have a very long history of um therapy within services mm. um, and may really struggle from time to time to maintain that equilibrium in, in in their life and may need quite a lot of support and and there's a category in of, a, of patients that or people that um fit in this category that we would term as personality disorders and so we thought we'd have a little bit of time thinking about that didn't we um yeah so do you want to say just loosely how it's affected um gis first um, well, I, we can talk about the range of, of, of people that we get Coming, up, we do have people with quite a sort of complex emotional needs, which is sometimes another an, another term for um, borderline personality disorder. That these terms change quite a bit, um, but also through to people who are struggling with um, depression and anxiety, and the, and then just people who, oh, but particularly older adults who who just are struggling with loneliness and isolation. Um, so there's it that you know. There's a whole range of people and, and issues so that we that we we see coming to us that we can deal with. In terms of the end of the spectrum, where the, the people who who are living with quite complex emotional needs, um, which another term I've mentioned is borderline personality disorder, um, that that what, those are the people that we're we're working with who who sort of exist in that space between secondary mental health services such as psychiatry. Mm -hmm. and, primary care which is the GP 
Mm. It don't necessarily meet the criteria for, um, for, for psychiatry. The GP is quite limited in terms of what they can actually do and support them with in terms of, you know, they can actually look at prescribing antidepressants or, or other medications. But, you know, in terms of a, a, a therapeutic intervention, it's quite limited. Um, so those, I think, are the sort of people that we are looking at, where well, we are working with quite a lot at the moment. Um, and people who are just really struggling with their mood and the changes in their mood. Um, one of the things with, with sort of personality disorders, particularly with emotionally unstable personality disorder, which is another term for borderline yeah. personality disorder. Yeah. There's so many different <laughs> terms and it's changing a lot. And, and these terms change. I recently found out that it's now called something else. And a, a, a reason for this is that there's always been this um, debate a, around the term because it carries a lot of stigma. Yes. And, and it's trying to use terms that are um, that people who live with the with the disorder are, are happy to use, but also with the, the, the sort of their professionals, healthcare professionals as well. So it's a it's it's a title that changes quite a bit. But there are certain characteristics I think with this condition that we see uh, that make life quite difficult sometimes. And it may be that the moods are very changeable, for example, something we call dysregulation. So moods, because it, it, it is sort of like a form of mood disorder, I, I feel anyway, I'm not, mm. yeah, yeah. No, but it's sort of, you know, where you have bipolar disorder, which is, uh, if you're looking at, um, you know, we, we sometimes see in the press, don't we, or she's bipolar or he's bipolar, you know, it seems like a very sort of common thing. But when you look at bipolar disorder, a true clinical presentation as it were moods tend to get high and they stay there for quite quite a long period of time and then they might go right down and stay there for you know but it's a certain length of time that, that those moods stay in that state whereas with borderline you know personality disorder the moods change very quickly and it's what we call dysregulation so somebody can feel great one minute and they're okay and the next minute they can plummet into a real sense of um, crisis where they want to die so they might be they might have very strong thoughts of suicide and self-harm around that you know and they might sort of use alcohol and drugs quite a bit to try and you know to try and make things a bit better for themselves but it doesn't always work that way so there's quite so life lifestyles become a bit chaotic and a bit, yeah. um, difficult. so there's you know lots of thoughts of suicide and there's sort of self-harm um, very difficult sustaining relationships with other people. Um, sometimes there's a you know sort of quite a bit of paranoia around things or perceived or rejection is very difficult to, to, to deal with um, or perceived rejection and so behavior becomes um, quite difficult you know yeah. and um, you're know, coming if you think I've missed something out there. No, I, I think that's a really good. Yeah. It's a really complex area, personality. Yes, yeah. And and there's a whole melee of things going on in there, mm -hmm. and of course it changes on a daily basis, which is what can make it so difficult yeah. Yeah. for the people suffering with it and for those around them. Um, and you know they they are within our workplace as well, so you know mm -hmm. we'll all come across people from time to time who may fit within this category. Um, and, the, and as you say, there's a diagnosis or a condition label called borderline personality disorder, which means that you, you've almost got that, but it's not quite controlling you in the way that, that, that it could be. Yeah. Uh, and thinking about what we can do about it um, and, and how you can help um, within GIS. With, that's where we've talked about DBT, which is the dialectical behaviour therapy being useful. And, and, and as a, in the NHS, they would deliver treatments on it, which would be a whole sort of series of therapeutic work going on over a period of time. So that's not what you offer, but, but what is useful and you do offer and, and want to um, increasingly offer is DBT skills. So it's taking bits and making them work day to day for people. Yes, that's right. So I, I think it's, again, it's going back to that psychoeducation thing too, where we are talking to people about what's, what's going on for them, I think, and helping them to make sense of what, what's happening. 
Um, and then we can we can look at signposting in, in terms of um, looking at more sort of appropriate therapy for them, but also just just looking at some just very basic and simple techniques and skills around how they can manage their, their, their moods and how they're feeling and, and drawing a lot of what DBT does is it draws a lot of mind on mindfulness as well. So looking at sort of relaxation, but also um, those sort of little things you can do to actually ground yourself when um, anxiety starts to get yeah. high or, or thinking starts to become quite distorted. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, it's really looking at maybe helping people to develop what we call a little toolkit of, yeah. of sort of skills and techniques that they can actually use um, to, to, to manage those, those experiences, those emotions, those feelings, those behaviours that, that come from that. And I think you touched on something a minute ago there where you said about the workplace. And this is, I, I think, an issue with, with, with sort of personality disorders is they can, they can exist in all of us, can't, can't and one of the aspects is that relationships can be quite difficult difficult to manage and I think that's what people with with personality disorders struggle with a lot is, is forming and sustaining those relationships those ordinary relationships particularly in the workplace um, because that's you know that's where most of our time is spent really isn't it and and and, and good and, and teams need to have our good teams are based on good interpersonal relationships and how we can work together. Um, so yes, yeah, so sometimes you know it, it can be very difficult if you've got an individual in a team who's been struggling with, with forming relationships and having good quality relationships with people, um, and you know sort of and, and also with their with their moods. You may have quite a bit of people taking a lot of time off um, or being quite disruptive in a team as well. And these individuals are not deliberately or knowingly doing that. This is something that, is, you know, they're, they're driven from a different, from within. And it, it, sometimes they don't always know that this is happening or they're creating this um, this chaos around them. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it is, like you said at the beginning, the dysregulation is it's mm. very up and down. So it, it can be very disruptive. And particularly if you're not sure, you know, if you're working alongside somebody at, at work who may be, borderline personality disorder or personality disorder you know they have every right to be at work and be working but it can be quite difficult for you uh, because you don't know what you're getting that day um, exactly and I think one of the characteristics of of, of personality disorder is that people self-harm mm. so that might be and, and self-harm is another complex area you know people don't self-harm to die it's it, it's separate issue to suicide or attempted suicide Sometimes people self-harm to stay alive, to cope, yes. to manage their emotions. So it's a it's a difficult area. But you know, that may be an issue, particularly for for organizations if you've got somebody who's who's self-harming, um, because of the intensity, of, you know, they, the intensity of their emotions is such that it, you know, they just can't manage it. They don't regulate emotions as you and I might do. It's a different process. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, and we, we've looked in GIS about um, possible ways that, that you might be able to help businesses um, to manage these situations, which we're going to come to a little bit later on mm. more thoroughly. But that's one of the things that we are considering is how do you help people learn enough skill sets to allow people to thrive at work rather than survive mm. or just get by yeah um, and another area that's a bit like um no, it's not like personality disorder at all but it does have difficulties in the workplace but you've done some work on it is um autism in the workplace for people who've got autism spectrum conditions mm. and, um, or who are neurodiverse um, yes in other yeah. words, the, the, that area of 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 difficulty in socializing and communicating and again yeah. autism is one of the ones that presents itself in a difficulty of being able to be mm. understood able to socialize able to make eye contact that, that mm. lots, lots and lots of different presentations like that mm. um, and you wrote a really interesting article which which uh, you sent me and I'm, I'm going to read later <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to talk a little bit about that about how, how that might yeah. 
I think, it, like you're saying, I mean, again, people who live with autism see the world through a slightly different lens or perceive the world, I think, through um, a, slight, a, a different lens. And, and you know, it, it, and that can involve the sort of the sensory world. So things like smell and taste and, and hearing and all of that sort of thing can. So and if you imagine in the workplace, if, you know, it, again, it depends where I think individuals are on the, the, the spectrum spectrum as it were but you know the, it, the workplace can be a very difficult place to be although these individuals have a huge amount to contribute mm. you know and can be very valuable for mm. conversations but they may have a difficulty with lighting for example certain types of lighting or noise mm. so, you know office traffic or as we call it might be very disruptive for them or or smell you know the, yeah. you know it's it's a very um so Oriana, the person I wrote the article with, who is a speech and language therapist, we, we were looking at, well, how can we work with employers to help create a workplace which is, um, which is sort of friendly for, the, for, for neurodiverse people who, who live with neurodiversity? Um, how can you create that office space? Is it really looking at the environment? How can you position a desk? How can you create um, you know, uh, a, you know, a, somewhere where there is there is less noise for example now I know that you know that may be but that is I think is about working it's about working with the individual in developing a sort of plan you know, and yes what it is they need from the workplace to make that experience better for them so that they are in turn able to work more effectively uh, yeah so it's, I mean, that's essentially what it is it's about working with the employer to and and I think your, your point at the beginning is really good, and we just want to highlight that, is that um, people who might be on the spectrum, well, one thing is we're all on the spectrum, mm, so mm, let's just normalise that. Yes. Um, but people who might suffer with it to an extreme that makes it difficult for them to go into the workplace, um, they have so much to offer. They, they yes. have oh, yeah. huge skills yeah. and they have huge skills that I do not have. Mm. So I can enhance what I'm looking to provide if I involve them in what I'm doing. So, you know, apart from us thinking it's nice to support people for diversity, which is wonderful and great, and we do, but also we will get a better end result if we are more inclusive in the way we approach things. Oh gosh, yes, totally. And I think, and also, I'm sorry about that. I've lost my mind. Sorry. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, I mean, absolutely. So I think it's, you know, if we're working with that individual about looking at designing their, their workplaces, but also around how people like to communicate also. And I think that's particularly an issue for people who are, living with, with, with autism around communication and relationships. I mean, you mentioned eye contact there a minute ago. I mean, that can be a big issue because communication is a, the, a, the main part of communication for us as a species is with our face. Yes. We, we communicate facially. I mean, if you're looking at those, those like, you know, those, the shape of the mouth and around the eyes, you know, where it's sort of hardwired almost to, to see the face to communicate from when we're born. If newborns, I mean, this is, you know, Mary, you probably know as a health system now, uh, is, you know, faces are really important to newborn. You know, they look to the, they look up to the face, just look at the shape of the mouth and the eyes. So, you know, we're almost hardwired to communicate that. So people who can't make eye contact or struggle with eye contact, you know, that's almost, you know, they, um, that can actually cause bigger problems, for example, say, for example, with communicating with people, with others around them. But if we work with individuals and we have a plan around that so that their, their colleagues know what's happening, they, they you know, we, we, we've got a sort of a strategy for communication, which is known by all, as it were, then that can sometimes make life a bit easier, I think, for all concerned, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And th these are things we can do things to help with. And, and in particular, GIS can be a great support service to do that, as well as working with individuals um, to help them in, in, in difficult situations and to provide a listening ear. And I think one of the things you do so well as a service is, is provide listening and just yeah, yeah. talk, which is really, really, yeah. we yeah. undervalue it sometimes how important that is. 
Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's it's confidential, and it's it yes, it's it's about listening, and it's about not judging people. I think is is important, so that people feel that they can disclose to us if they need to, that we're not going to to make any judgments on their on what they've done or their behaviour, but also that we can keep our information safe. Yes. Yeah. And I think that is actually quite important for people as well. Yes. And and as a charity moving forwards, you know, coming toward the end of the pandemic, hopefully, although perhaps not, as we as we heard on the news this morning, um, what can we do to help people in your situation at the moment where you have been really adversely affected in some ways by the pandemic because of finance for your organization yeah equally the need is bigger than ever so how can businesses that might be listening into this or people that might be listening into this how can they potentially help you or um show the service need to you or what, what would be the best the, the range of things they could do or the best thing they could do well, yeah, that, that, thank you, Matt. I mean, our, our funding is is limited. You know, we we, we had the, secured the big lottery funding to start the service, which is what we've done, and that funding is 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 um, is, is coming to an end shortly. So we need to look at how we can work with um, whether it's organisations, businesses, whether it's with other um, groups within the voluntary sector or the NHS, and sort of setting up some sort of partnership. But what I'd like, I'm really quite keen to work with organisations in um, sort of creating a, a sort of a bespoke service, I suppose, yeah. for the workforce, you know, and um, and obviously to be to, to be sort of funded for that, I suppose, to have some sort of partnership where we're working, where we could provide a service for an organisation um, on, on a range of things. As I said, working in a, a, a way that's bespoke, working. Mm-hmm with the workforce and setting up something in terms of what they feel they need. And there is a lot we can do in terms of workshops or a one-to-one service. Another area I think is really quite important and, and something which I'm quite keen on looking at is people, is women returning to, to the workforce after our maternity leave. Um, and that's something, my, my early experiences as a, as, as a mental health nurse many years ago when I started out was actually on a, a, men, on, on a mother and baby unit for women who were um, really, really struggling with postnatal depression yeah. and, how, and how that affected you know, their relationship with, with the baby. And, 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 you know, and a lot of these women were actually on, on maternity leave at the time, but they would be going back to yeah. work. And that was a sort of big part of what we did was how, you know, how can we, um, how can we enable you to make that transition back into the workplace after you've had this really quite devastating sort of depression, really. I mean, and not all women will have a very serious postnatal depression, but a lot of women, I think, do struggle with that transition. Yeah, and 10% of people will have postnatal mm-hmm. depression. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Not, not the high-end purple psychosis type of yeah. depression, although that does occur. And it yes. comes out the blue, and it can be very with people you would never have thought. It's not there isn't oh, a yeah. no. that it just happens or doesn't happen. Um, but the ten percent of people, you know, there's going to be people in your place of work or that you know of that could benefit from support that that perhaps could be given in terms of maintaining the relationship between work and mum at home, or even or if dads are taking paternity leave to look after children. Um, maintaining that relationship and getting people in the best place to come back and feel good about it, not anxious. Yes, yeah, and because I, you know, I think that for, for a lot of women, our identity shifts, doesn't it, when they when they've had a baby, when they become a mother, and I think it's about how how can we support a lot of women to manage that. Yeah, and I think to manage that that anxiety about coming back into the workplace. And also maybe that ambivalence that they might feel as well. You know, yeah. they, should I be here? Should I not? Should, what, what, you know, I've got this guilt. Yeah. I've got this, you know, is everything all right? What's happening? Am I a bad mother? Am I, you know, so it's all of that, all of that sort of, those issues. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, yeah, exactly. So as, as we draw to a close, um, I, I think 
what one message it would be really nice to leave people with is you know if you are working in a, in a business or you you're a, a, an owner of a business or you're a ceo of a business or in whatever capacity you're watching first of all gis is there to support individuals whether it's you whether it's a family member whether it's a colleague um, and they're also there to help business environments to maintain the well-being of staff at work and lots of things can be done about that and to contact you which we will put the numbers underneath um, so that you can do that and the other thing is we've done a little survey monkey um, so we would really like anyone who watches this just to very quickly it'll take you probably less than a minute just to go on the survey monkey and give us a bit of information about what you might like offered as as workplace support for mental well-being at work um, so we'll put that link underneath with the contact numbers for GIS. Um, but thank you, Avril, you've been brilliant. Thank you so much. Oh, I, I hope so. I feel a bit of it, but, you know, do, do get in touch with me if, if um, you know, a particular, I mean, I'm really keen to sort of connect with, with, with businesses if they want to look at workshops, for example, and, you know, just to explore this stuff a bit more you know, with, with people, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And we'll see you all again in a month's time.